Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rick Steves. Thank you very much. And it feels good to come out of the closet, doesn't it? Isn't it a strange sort of concept that we have to come out of the concept about something that just feels like a very basic civil liberty? Uh, you know, you've heard all of the um, talking points and so on from the, the main stage and so on, and I thought this is for the, the eager students here at Hymposium. So I'm just going to give you a little background on uh, my experience in speaking out on this issue in public, not at Hempfest. It's easy to talk about it here but it's tougher to talk about it, you know, at your parent-teacher association meetings or with your friends down the street or, or, or at the supermarket or something like this. So I want to talk about that. I've also had some interesting um, challenge to try to understand the other side better, respect the other side, understand what motivates them, because, you know, I think it's good citizenship all around, and it's just awareness raising and enlightening people, sharing other people's challenges and how they've succeeded and what they've learned, where we can move forward on this. So that's what I want to talk about. Uh, a little while ago, I had dinner with uh, Gil Kerlikowski's sort of lead narcotics guy in Seattle. Wonderful man, beautiful guy. I just, him and I kind of clicked, and I didn't realize, but Kerlikowski had sent him out to listen to me give my talks around the Puget Sound area, just to see what Hempfest kind of people were doing, you know, and and uh, I sat down with him and we had a great dinner. He disagreed with everything I said, except my contention that you can make a very good case that the mature adult use of marijuana is a civil liberty. But he said, you've got to cover the other bases, driving, access to kids, addiction, abuse, education, all this kind of stuff. So it's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting sort of challenge that we have here. He asked me after that dinner, he said, why, he said, you're some, you know, well-off white guy in the suburbs. You could smoke pot, no problem at all. You can invite your friends over and have a great party, no problem. Why are you in this fight? And I thought about it. And he's right. Uh, you know, most of us can smoke with discretion and be fine. Uh, but there really is a matter of principle about this. And uh, I thought about it and I thought, I am really into travel. You know, I'm a travel writer. I've spent a third of my adult life just traveling. I just love going places. And to me, high is a place. And I really treasure that. And when I want to go there, I want to go there. I, I don't need my government to give me a passport for that place. Now, there are cases when our government can tell us we can't go there for various reasons, and we've got to live with it, you know? You can argue about Cuba, but you can't go there. All right, there's reasons. Um, when it comes to high, I just don't think there's a good reason. I mean, they've got wrong reasons. They've got reasons based on fear and lies and what's going to get them elected. But there's no real honest reason why we cannot go there. I have thought about this a lot. And, you know, basically a lot of us just like to smoke pot. Uh, most of my friends, most of my business associates, uh, you know, if you locked up everybody in our community that likes to smoke pot recreationally, it would be a major blow to our communities, to our businesses and so on. And it's just sort of my theme that the mature adult recreational consumption of marijuana is a civil liberty. I don't like to mince around, I don't like to dance around it, I just like to say that really clearly. I mean, of course, medical marijuana is a very serious thing. My passion is this civil liberties thing. That's why I'm working closely with the ACLU. That's been my theme as a board member with Normal for the last uh, 10 years. Now, again, our challenge is how do we protect this civil liberty and at the same time deal with the downside of pot? Marijuana is a drug. You can have all sorts of ideals. You know, Initiative 505's got great, great ideals. I respect their idealism. But I live in a reality out there. I live in a reality where 800,000 Americans were arrested last year. They weren't rich white guys. They were poor people and people of color. They're people for the rest of their lives, they're gonna have a, a cross to bear. They're gonna be at a further disadvantage. And that's just flat out wrong. And the irony is, people who make that law are afraid of them, and because of that law, they've got more to be afraid of. We've reached yeah. a point in our society where if we lock up any more people, it's gonna get more dangerous. Yeah. You know what I mean? You take nonviolent people who got in trouble for some experimental drug use, put them into prison, then they come out, they've been to finishing school, and they can't get a job. They're gonna become part of that criminal system. We need to take ideas like this and mess up otherwise, you know, uh, polite dinners and uh, challenge people to say, where are you getting your information? How do you really know that? 
there's so many exciting things, and I've been at this for 10 years, and I've learned these exciting points that you can just inject into conversations. If you distill it down to a bumper sticker, it's going to be hard on drugs or soft on drugs, and we're going to lose. We've got to get beyond that. We've got to get enough of an attention span so we can educate people about this. You know, you can't do it on public, on commercial television very well. We do it on, on public television. I won't do a pledge drive right now, but I just spent an hour at KCTS with The Weekly with a wonderful panel of people that are co-sponsoring these initiatives, and we really got some great information out there. But it is a trick to get that information out. We produced a half-hour video with the ACLU. You might have seen it. You can see it on, online, uh, Marijuana Time for a Discussion. I just love that thing because it raises awareness. I was so proud to be a part of that. We wrote that very carefully with all the legalistic sensitivity so that we could buy time to put it on Cairo or Como or King, you know? We paid them money to produce it in their studios. And I mean, it's just like, you know, a thigh master. If you pay the money, you can put it on TV. But they wouldn't let us air that show, except once after Girls Gone Wild at about 2 a.m., you know, you could put it on. And, uh, but it's just like evil information because it challenges this status quo with a thoughtful, reasonable, harm reduction of point uh, approach to marijuana drug policy. Now, so getting back to this, how are we gonna make it clear that this is a civil liberty, which my friend on the other side said is a very strong argument, but you gotta deal with the political reality. Marijuana is a drug. We're not promoting a use of a drug. We're promoting the right to use it if you want to. I've never promoted marijuana, I'm really careful about that. I promote the use of it as a civil liberty. I think people understandably need to hear us say that drugs can be abused it, to acknowledge it is a problem in our society. There is an educational component of this. The drinking and smoking and then driving while intoxicated is not an issue that we can wish away. The idealists in 505 camp, you know, again, I wish it was, I wish we could sell the 505 initiative, but I want to, I want to put out an initiative that can be embraced. And everywhere you talk outside of Hemfest, Parents in the suburbs don't want their kid hit by somebody who's high on something. That's not gonna go away. And we need to deal with that and we don't have enough scientific evidence now to deal with it properly. We need to get something where we can have some funds and a drug that can be tested by human beings. I just spent a day up at a pharmaceutical convention up in uh, past Everett there with a bunch of doctors and pharmacists and scientists and professors. All day long, the topic was the pharmaceutical nature of marijuana. And it was fascinating to me, these are like 300 very highly trained uh, medical specialists, they could not, the only evidence they were using was evidence of the effect of marijuana on rats and hamsters because it was illegal and they couldn't use evidence of uh, marijuana on people. They couldn't acknowledge even that people would use it, you see. I mean, there's that kind of a disconnect right now between science and acceptable science and, and the reality. And I just said, you know, you don't need to get this hamster high, you know. Just go across the street and talk to somebody and ask them what it's like. I mean, it's that simple, but they couldn't do it. So we have that challenge. Um, so you got this drinking and driving concern. You got the, uh, the whole fear of children and getting their uh, hands on drugs. And uh, this has got to be addressed, and it's got to be addressed smartly. And that's an issue that is near and dear to any parent's hearts. So I often wonder why our generation didn't just grow into power and marijuana would become uh, regulated and taxed and, and like alcohol and, and so on. But it didn't happen. Why? Because we, came, we became parents, yeah. we worry about our kids, and then we are victimized by a lot of government-sponsored uh, reefer madness kind of propaganda that twists the truth, and they tell us it's 20 times as strong as it was when we were kids or whatever, <laughs> and this kind of stuff, and we buy it. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about this sort of uh, information, this angle on the issue, and I want to give you um, just sort of my take on it as a traveler and a travel writer. I bring a European sort of sensibility, I think, to the, the whole discussion. And as I mentioned, I spend a lot of time in Europe. That's my beat. I write guidebooks about Europe and make this TV show on public television and so on. And uh, it's so interesting to me how America brags about how we are the land of uh, the pursuit of happiness and you know, grab, live life with gusto and everything like that. And when you travel a lot, you come home, and there's a sort of a culture shock in reverse, and you realize we are really quite an uptight society in a lot of ways compared to Europeans. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've taken groups to spas in Germany where everybody just kind of gets naked and relaxes. And my people won't even go in. I mean, I just can't believe it. They're just so afraid of that. When I produce my TV show, if it has any, any nudity on it, it won't be aired in the more conservative parts of our country. My show, which you've probably seen on Channel 9, actually has to be aired after 10 o'clock in parts of our country because we show 500-year-old marble penises. 
and uh, you know, 800 year old canvas nudes, uh, breasts, you know? And uh, we have a law that, that terrorizes stations into shielding people's eyes from this kind of end of, uh, of, of our world. And uh, when you travel, you realize there are different ways to address these sort of edgy issues. But here in the United States, I think we are sort of fearful and driven into sort of a compliance with what we think is the norm, and I don't think it really is. So we have these, these sort of uptight areas, and, and for me, the whole thing about marijuana was just one lie too many, one bit of uptightness too many. And of course, when I go to Europe, for my friends over there, a joint is about as exciting as a can of beer. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's very, very clear that we've got this prohibition on marijuana that is uh, something that is very costly to our society. And when you go to other societies, they care about drug abuse and drug-related problems just as much as we do, but they approach it in a much more progressive and pragmatic way. Um, so I speak out, uh, uh, you know, from that perspective, um, uh, when I, uh, part of my work as a traveler is to get people out of their comfort zones. I think this is a fundamental thing about travel is you, you, you hang out with people who find different truths to be self-evident and God-given. You look at something that used to be scary and then you get to know the person and it's not scary. A, a whirling dervish, I mean, looks kind of freaky to a lot of Americans. But if you talk to the guy and you find out what he's thinking when he's whirling around, it becomes a beautiful thing. It becomes a very beautiful thing. Uh, you know, foie gras. A lot of people are all uptight about foie gras because you have to force feed the geese. Well, you can go to a goose farm in France and learn a little bit about the situation, and it becomes quite a bit different. Uh, I have so much fun in my TV show of trying to expose people to things. We went to Iran, very frightening place. I was afraid before I went to Iran. Got there and I realized uh, they're just as afraid of us as we are of them. And if we can just meet each other, all of a sudden it becomes much uh, sort of uh, more potential to get together. I love, I've just got something in my nature to try to get people out of their comfort zones in a constructive way. I remember when my boy was about three years old and we were having, you know, saying thank you for <laughs> table grace and invite grandma and grandpa over. I teach my son at the end of the prayer to go, Allah, Allah, Allah. And it just to freak out my dad, you know. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> We can get people out of their comfort zones when we travel, and I think it's a good thing to get people out of their comfort zones here, too. I mean, to me, Hempfest, for a lot of people, is uh, out of their comfort zone. Wouldn't it be great if a lot of people who don't know anything about this issue could come here and just feel this mellow vibe and see the police and the mayor of Seattle yesterday on stage and, and see this kind of commitment to, uh, you know, just fun and civil liberties and, uh, and compassionate, compassionate medical use and pragmatic harm reduction. So it's a fun challenge for all of us here. Um, and uh, when it comes to the whole marijuana thing, when you go to Europe, it's hard to paint a broad stroke here because it's easy to say Europe's this way, but the fact is there's uh, you know, 20 different countries and they all have different rules on this sort of thing. Some of them are more regressive than we are. Most of them are much more progressive than we are. Generally, in Europe, they have drug policies motivated by pragmatic harm reduction. For eight years of the administration before Obama, any proposition about drug policy that was submitted to our government, if it had the word harm reduction in it, it was rejected out of hand. That was code for legalization. They would not consider anything that was not incarceration-based rather than pragmatic harm reduction-based. Well, in Europe, they really are concerned about drug abuse. Uh, you know, they lose a lot of people to heroin overdoses. So do we. How are you going to solve that? We do it by locking people up. We do it with misinformation and fear. They do it with pragmatic harm reduction. In Europe, they believe if you take crime out of the equation, if you take the money and the violence out of the equation, you can treat drug abuse as a health problem and an education challenge. That is a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's really fun to see the European approach to this. Um, and Europe has a concern about hard drugs and they put marijuana in with alcohol and, uh, and uh, tobacco as a, a, a drug that can be um, not healthy for you and so on, but it's not gonna be treated like hard drugs. And uh, I think with that approach, um, you can look back and see why did marijuana end up where it ended up. It's a fascinating story. Uh, I was hanging out with Bud Eagle Crow. Remember him? He was uh, the guy who deputized Elvis Presley to be the drug marshal in the United States back, back in Nixon's uh, rule. And when, when Nixon decided to, uh, well, Nixon was just pissed off about all the hippies who were standing against his Vietnam policies, I guess. And he thought, well, the main drug of all those hippies, those peaceniks, is marijuana. I'm going to put their drug in with uh, LSD and uh, heroin or whatever. And uh, from that day on, I think marijuana has been tossed in, out of where it should be, in with hard, more addictive, more destructive drugs, and not with alcohol where I believe it should be. 
when we look at European, European treatment of marijuana, you find, you look at their website, in the EU website, there's no, um, there, there's no, like, um, uh, well, wh where you find it is problematic cannabis use. If you search and search and search for marijuana, there is problematic cannabis use. I think in Germany, they, no, in France, they had a, a belief that young men would smoke marijuana so they would be more comfortable uh, courting women. And uh, they actually had flirting con con consultations to help guys be more comfortable with girls without having to smoke pot. There's, you know, it's, it seems kind of wacky, but what the point is they're thinking out of the box in order to help people not uh, get into drugs when they don't need to get into drugs rather than criminalizing it. Um, when you think about how Europe handles its soft drug, or just any drug abuse problems, it is always, it just seems to me it's always more pragmatic than we do. For instance, alcohol. When I'm in uh, Scandinavia in May and June, I'm always impressed by how many wild, drunk teenagers are roaming around town in the back of decorated trucks, pickup trucks and, and flatbed trucks. And then I ask my friends, what's going on? It's graduation time. And all these kids, kids are just getting really drunk and their parents are hosting the kickers. And the deal is the parents will rent a, car, a truck with a driver, the parents will get together and have a kegger in each house or apartment or whatever, and the kids will go from house to house uh, being hosted by their parents and just get really blitzed. And uh, the parents know that nobody's gonna be drinking and driving. Now, parents don't want their kids to drink and, and drive. Uh, you know, in America, we parents tell our kids, promise me you won't drink on graduation and never get in a car with somebody else who's driving. Well, people, kids promise that, but invariably in the United States, because we have this just say no approach Without the pragmatism and the, and the reality, kids lie, kids get in cars where people have been drinking, and on graduation every year, kids die. In Scandinavia, the parents are more pragmatic, kids don't have to lie, nobody drives and drinks, kids have a great time, everybody is just wasted the next day, but uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a Scandinavian pragmatic approach to a drug abuse problem. That'd be a very tough sell here in the United States, but from a Scandinavian's point of view, that is smart drug policy. You know, don't do the just say no thing, hire a driver in a truck and host the kegger. Now, when you think about that just for a little, uh, something like alcohol, similar uh, pragmatism is in other soft drugs and in hard drugs. When you go around Europe, uh, you'll find they have a very, very pragmatic approach to hard drug abuse. Last year in the United States, 18,000 Americans died of heroin overdoses. In Europe, 10,000 died. All right, it's a major problem on both sides of the Atlantic. Here in the United States, we lock up a lot of uh, hard drug users. In Europe, uh, they don't lock them up, they, they treat them as people who have medical problems. They need to get their lives back on track. If you, I was just in Switzerland, and when you want to go to a public restroom, I went to a Starbucks, went downstairs to, to go to the bathroom, blue lights, blue lights in the Starbucks toilet. And then I realized, ah yes, blue lights, I cannot see my veins. See, I couldn't shoot up if I wanted to. Really frustrating. And, uh, um, <laughs> And then I realized that's a very, very European style pragmatic approach to a persistent problem. You got all these junkies around here, they're always looking for a private place to shoot up and you don't want them doing it in your, in your bathroom. I was just in Estonia, in a poor part of town in Tallinn where the Russian community is, and that's the underclass in Estonia, and I went to the gas station into the toilet, blue light, same thing. They don't want the Russian drug population shooting up in their bathrooms. Okay, back to Switzerland. All right, they can't shoot up there. You go across the street and you see a machine bolted to a metal railing used to sell cigarettes. Now the machine sells government subsidized syringes. All right, it costs like a dollar for two syringes. They're just generic syringes distributed by the government. That's a tough sell in the United States. But in Switzerland, you're crazy to pass needles around. Nobody shares needles. You get them for almost free on the street corner. I didn't realize it, but now I've seen that and everywhere you look, you see former uh, uh, cigarette dispensers selling syringes. That's a society motivated not by incarcerating people and, and sort of moralistic, just say no stuff, but pragmatic, European style harm reduction. Down the street, there's a ugly little gathering of wasted people. It's a cafe fix. It's a heroin maintenance center. It looks ugly, but it's a beautiful thing. These are people in tough straits because of heroin addiction, and they've got a safe place to get counseling, to get uh, their, their, their uh, habit uh, topped up, and a place to uh, get their lives back on track and get back in the job force. It's amazing. I've taken tourists around Europe for years and a lot of uh, naive Americans say, there's so many drug addicts over here. These Europeans are so liberal and look what happens. Well, the fact is their drug addicts are alive and not in jail. 
They're out on the streets. They're in cafe fixes, heroin maintenance clinics, getting their needles so they don't have to swap them on the, down the alley and so on. It's quite inspiring when I look at how Europe handles these drug issues. It's not an easy thing. Drug, uh, drug abuse is a serious problem, but we can do better here in the United States. And to me, that's very exciting. And a very good starting point is what we're doing right here at HempFest, raising awareness of the fact that marijuana should not be illegal. So when we think about when we think about marijuana policy in Europe, Holland comes to mind, the Netherlands, you know, they haven't arrested a pot smoker there for 25 years. And, uh, you know, I, I've got a guidebook to Amsterdam, so I have to do a lot of research there in the coffee shops. And uh, it is the coolest scene, you know. I mean, you got travelers in there checking their email and they're just one big cloud of smoke. And uh, you got older people that don't really like the, the youthful kind of vibe. So they just come in and get their pot to go. They'll park their bike, come in, get what they like, head out head on out, uh, you got uh, different sort of personalities of different coffee shops. I've got an older readership, so I get a little more mellow and laid back kind of places that my readership would be more comfortable in. And when you go to these coffee shops, you understand the complicated reality of marijuana uh, commerce post legalization. Now in the Netherlands, it's not really legal because you cannot legalize marijuana without finding yourself in a trade war with the United States of America. I've got friends in Denmark, you've probably heard in Copenhagen of Christiania where they've got the marijuana and stuff. And uh, they tell me, I'm up there, you know, and there's lots of marijuana floating around and everything. And they say, uh, be careful when you leave with this marijuana because in, the, in, the, in Denmark we have to arrest a couple of pot smokers every year in order to maintain favorable trade status with the United States. Wow. See, they don't, they don't want to arrest them, but it's just a pragmatic thing. You just don't want to incur the economic devastation of going into a, economic, a, a trade war with the United States. So, my friends who run coffee shops in Amsterdam explained to me there's those kind of dynamics and there's a lot of pressure from the United States, a lot of pressure from right-wing religious groups and so on for them to, to roll back the uh, uh, liberalness of their coffee shop culture and their coffee shop industry. Also, there's this concern all over Europe that you don't want to have drug tourism. People from more regressive countries take on the train for two hours to get to the Netherlands, they buy up all their pot and then they go home. Well, that's not... Germany doesn't like that. Germany says marijuana is illegal and people go over to across the border and they just pick it up and go home. Consequently, the, the coffee shops with the biggest uh, turnover are the ones right along the border. And those are the ones that are having to have cards where you have to be a local citizen to go there and, and be a customer. Uh, you'll hear that they're rolling them back in the Netherlands. It's, uh, you know, you always hear the, the news when they roll it back and then the, in practice it sort of lives on. And I don't know exactly what the, the latest is, but it's a, you know, it's a constant struggle over there because there's a lot of forces that are, are sort of, uh, you know, threatened by their progressive attitude about this. I was talking about the complexity of what happens after you do legalize marijuana. Roger Goodman, you know him probably, he's a local congressman yeah. or he's running for Congress for James C. Spox. Cool guy, by the way. Very oh. courageous. And he's been speaking out in a very uh, viable, thoughtful, easy to embrace from a general public point of view, drug policy points. And uh, Roger's just a, a beautiful guy. Years ago, he put on a three-day seminar with the Seattle Bar Association. Taught, well, the whole theme of the convention was, let's assume marijuana is legal. Now what do we do? You know, how do you, how do you wholesale it? How do you advertise it? How do you regulate it? This is, nobody's figured this out. The Netherlands have been doing this for 25 years. They decided to quasi-legalize it, but the wholesale end of it is still wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All right? It's called the gray area. The gray area. It's just, uh, I was talking to these guys and, uh, you know, they've got their laws. For instance, if you're an American here, you're worried about, oh, if they legalize marijuana, they're going to be having big billboards advertising it to my children right across the street from school. These are the issues we should be dealing with here you know, when we think of practicality, where are we going to go with this? Well, in the Netherlands, they have dealt with this, and you cannot advertise marijuana. You cannot, you step into a coffee shop, and this is what I do in my work. I go in as a clueless tourist, and I figure out, I'm confused, what do I do? And I have to learn, and then I write it down so people with my guidebooks can uh, learn from my experience there. You go into a coffee shop, if you've never been in one before, you kind of, you're first struck by, I want to spend some money, but I don't know what to buy. I, where's the menu? Because they can't advertise it, it can't come at you. It can't be like on a restaurant where they post it on the door. So the guy says, if you want to know what's for sale, you got to push this button. So you push this button and a, and a thing lights up and you are physically illuminating the menu. The point is, it seems like legal hair splitting, but the point is the information doesn't come to you. The consumer goes to the information. Now, that seems a little wacky maybe, but that's dealing with a very real and legitimate concern of the general populace that wouldn't think this is a fun party. 
all right? They don't want people promoting pot to their kids. And that's, I can live with that, you know? Uh, they've got an issue of, they don't want um, uh, people buying a lot and then going and, 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 uh, and, and selling it. They want it pretty much just small time. So they limit you to a couple of, uh, just a small amount per day. Very strict limit of people uh, only over 18 that can go into these coffee shops. Definitely no hard drugs. The police see it as a firewall. The police like this because they know where the drug experimenting population goes and the police are concerned about hard drug abuse, not soft drug use. And the police even have bulletin boards in these coffee shops so they can communicate what's dangerous on the streets in the way of chemical drugs. So you know, that's, and wow. that's a surprise to think police would find a coffee shop as a very handy tool for pragmatic harm reduction drug issues, you see. That's real drug policy, rather than this just say no marijuana is going to kill you. So. Um, in in a coffee shop in Amsterdam, there is a limit of 500 grams that they can have in their inventory at any time. That's about a pound. They can keep a pound of marijuana in their shop. The mayor of Amsterdam, last time I was there, was advocating to double that limit to one kilo because it would cut in uh, cut down on traffic congestion because there were so many little yep. heady deliveries going around all over town. You could you could gross a ton of marijuana but you can never have more than 500 grams in stock at any one time, you see? So I, I just find all of these little backside issues just so fun when you think about how progressive Europeans are and how creative they are and how unfearful they are, how pragmatic they are. You know, when I was first going to the Netherlands, you were getting an opportunity to buy pot from Morocco or Pakistan or wherever. Now it's all grown right there in the Netherlands. They've got the technology to grow the equivalent of Pakistan or whatever you liked about you know, Morocco or something like that right there, and it's too dangerous and complicated for them to import it. They don't need to import it anymore. It's locally grown. <laughs> There's just, all of these things just blossom when you get down to real pragmatic issues rather than throwing around bumper stickers. The children at risk thing is a major concern for Europeans as well as Americans. Dutch cops know that in the United States, it's easier for kids to get their hands on marijuana than it is to get their hands on alcohol, because as anybody in this game knows, the best way to lose control of something is to make it illegal. If you want to make it tough for kids to get, you regulate it. You just regulate it. It's such a clear, logical sort of thing that the average fearful voter in the suburbs needs to learn, and that's who we need to talk with. Um, when you think about the fear in our society, we can look at Europe and see how they've handled it. Ten years ago in Portugal, they decided to legalize the consumption of all drugs. All drugs. And I just interviewed the, uh, their drug czar who wrote that law for my radio show. And uh, you can see it on my website if you ever want to hear it. But uh, they said after 10 years now, they have done a review of the effectiveness. Because it was a little scary, you know, to legalize the consumption of all drugs. And they've decided after 10 years, even people who were opposed to it, that use has not gone up. They took the crime out of the equation. And now they can deal with it in a smart, pragmatic, harm reduction kind of way. Pretty good. What they've done is they've made marijuana boring. It's no longer quite so sexy, you know, and it's just there for people who want it. It's really quite amazing. Now, a lot of Americans think there's a whole reservoir of people out there that would just love to ruin their lives by smoking pot if only it was legal. These people are clueless. Anybody who wants to smoke pot, I think, does. Right. And they just have to be criminals to do it. And I'm convinced if you legalize marijuana tomorrow in, in, in Washington State, use might spike a little bit. It would settle back down to about where it is today and uh, it would just be a non-issue. That's what it is in Europe, a non-issue. There's no clear rule book. Nobody knows exactly how to do it. By my little anecdotal case studies in Europe, every country has a different approach to it. In Spain, you will see marijuana uh, leaves all over that are just advertising little shops. They just look like little, little knick-knack shops. So there are little garden shops, and these are grow-your-own shops. And in, in uh, Spain, you can't sell marijuana, but you can grow it for your own use. So there's no retail sale of marijuana, but there is sale of all the gear you need to grow it well and seeds. So next time you go to Spain, you'll see that and you'll have to hang around long enough to grow it in order to take advantage of that, okay? Uh, now, is that better than the Netherlands or the Portuguese approach? Well, they're all better than what we got, aren't they? I, I, there's, no, there's no perfect solution. So you're gonna hear people complaining about 502, we need to take a step forward. We need to take it out of the 
the, the lock up 800,000 people, or arrest 800,000 people a year zone, and then we can figure out where to go from there. But I really believe, even with all of its flaws, if 502 passes, it becomes less scary for the people that need to have the fear taken out of this. And from there, we can get to a very reasonable uh, arrangement like they have in Europe. At least that's my hope. I'll tell you just a few of the ideas that came from my talk with the, uh, the main uh, drug guy in the Seattle police force before he went to be the police chief of another city. Um, his mission is to protect kids and stop violence and to enforce existing laws. They don't have strong feelings about marijuana. It's sort of, I would imagine, sort of, it's sort of a drag to have to even worry about this, but they have to enforce laws. They're worried about protecting kids and stopping violence. Uh, they don't evaluate the laws for them. They don't differentiate between different kinds of drugs. It's just when they see problems, there's drugs. There's hard drugs, there's marijuana, there's alcohol. It's just problems, alcohol, or drugs equals problems. Uh, they are sort of insulted by medical marijuana because of the sham aspect of medical marijuana. And it is, if I was a police officer, I would sort of be insulted by it too. Not to de-legitimize uh, the whole uh, uh, you know, validity of medical marijuana, but the fact is people go in to get their clinic card not claiming glaucoma because that can be checked, but they say they got a sore neck and that really can't be verified. Um, whenever you use that word harm reduction, that's a catchphrase for legalization. I hope that's going to change in the near future. Um, and... Uh, one problem they have with our whole discussion is that they don't believe in any of our numbers. And, and it's hard to get straight numbers anywhere. If you look on the internet, who made these numbers up, you know, the right or the left, it's just a frustrating thing. I wish we could get more numbers. If you want to be credible, I think it's important that we acknowledge explicitly that children need to be protected from marijuana. Uh, we need to acknowledge that it's not healthy. It can be abused and it can be addictive. I don't even know if it can be addictive. I guess it can be psychologically addictive. I know people that have smoked every day for 20 years and then they just decide to stop and it's no problem. Other people, they got weaker character, I guess, and they just become psychologically addicted or maybe it's physically addicted. Whatever the case, throw them that bone. Admit, it can be addictive. It's not healthy. It's a drug. It can be abused. I'm not saying it's healthy. I'm saying it should not be a crime. Now, I've been speaking out of this for a long time, and uh, I'll tell you, we've made a lot of progress. If you feel frustrated, we've made a lot of progress. When I came out, I mean, I spoke on Jim French's show. I don't know if you old-time Seattleites know Jim French. He was a great radio guy back in the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s, and uh, I had to go as an anonymous responsible user back then. Uh, but it's so nice to not have to be so anonymous. But uh, 10 years or so ago when I joined Normal and uh, first spoke out, I just felt like man, I was like some sort of a child molester or something. People push me down in the chair and there's all these cameras on me and it was scary. Now, it's not scary at all. I was standing on main stage yesterday with the mayor of Seattle. I mean, that is really cool. Every one of our yeah. representatives is hit to this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the people we've got on board for 502, it's just inconceivable five years ago. Like Roger Goodman has learned, you cannot assassinate somebody's character politically now because they're smart on drugs. Roger Goodman's opponents try to. They spend good money trying to make him seem soft on drugs to his electorate. And every time his opponents try to assassinate his character because of his stand on marijuana, Roger's numbers spike upward, all right? Yeah. That's a new age, I'll tell you. That is a new age, and we gotta be smart to capitalize on that. Yeah. I think it's, it's a little frustrating for me to come to Hempfest because I get a sense that 90% of the people here, you know, they, they just, they just uh, are not doing anything to push it forward in a smart way. It's a beautiful festival. Vivian taught me that in a very nice way that this is a, a, a celebration for a legitimate part of our society to come out and be who they are in public. And that in itself is really something to celebrate. You know? I mean, it's not my crowd, but I just love that we can do this. But what I'm concerned about is how these laws are messing up people. And we owe it to, if we're good citizens, we owe it to each other to get out there now and uh, you know, clean up our act and, and use this word in polite company. People freak out when they hear the word marijuana. Talk about it in a smart, compassionate, knowledgeable way. Share it with community leaders. I took my pastor for a walk and told him, I'm gonna be speaking out from now on out about marijuana and I want you to know why. And he wow. bought it. The Church Council of Seattle is with us. Yeah. You know, they are with us. Yeah. Teachers are with us. Teachers can't talk because they're afraid of losing their job or their option for a, a raise or something like that, but they're with us. Politicians are with us. 
the media is with us when the mic is off. I've been on uh, with the mic you know, all over the country and, and people are asking me all these straight, nervous questions. As soon as the mic's off, they say, thank you for speaking out, you know? We need to speak out. We need to speak out in a way that does not scare people. Some people say, well, what about your business? You know, I, I, I employ 80 people up in Edmonds. What's this gonna matter to your business? Well, frankly, yeah. I'm not worried about my business. I'm worried about the truth. I, if it hurt my business, I'd do the same thing. Yeah. But, the fun news is, I think it's actually pretty good for my business. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only business in Seattle that's not selling uh, Doritos or rolling papers that's got a banner up on the main stage, I think. <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm, it's a breakthrough. This is a real market here if you're just looking for uh, an advertising in. But, uh, I, you know, I get a lot of people that read about what I think about marijuana. And they say, I know what you think about pot and we're not going to use your guidebooks anymore and we're not going to take any of your Europe tours. And all I can think is Europe's going to be more fun without you, all right? <laughs> I, really think, I really think the public is ahead of the politicians on this. And the politicians are learning. And I actually think the politicians are ahead of the corporations. I think the corporations are really the scared ones. And I think the corporations are really... In so many ways, they're pissing me off these days, you know? Uh, and uh, this is one area where they're just, they act like they're moralistic, but they're just reading the tea leaves and what's good for their business. Google um, Michael Phelps, is that his name? And uh, who is his under, uh, Kellogg's or something like that? Uh, you know, he, uh, he was uh, caught smoking marijuana. He was a poster boy for, was it Kellogg's? Yes. Yeah, and yeah. then, so Kellogg's was gonna say, you know, get rid of him and their, uh, and their, uh, all their stock values died when they got rid of Michael Phelps. So, what was it then? Subway Sandwich was also supporting Michael Phelps. They were going to get rid of him too. They had a board meeting, and they looked at what happened to Kellogg's when they got rid of Michael Phelps. And then Subway thought, well, we better keep him on board. In fact, they came out with an advertising campaign immediately after that called Have a Subway Sandwich and Feel the Buzz. <laughs> Check it out. Check it out. I mean, it's just amazing. But it just clarified my hunch that they're only moralistic not because they're moral, but because they're looking to profit maximize. And we can change that so corporations won't be so threatened by profit maximization. I walk a fine line in my work with my underwriting and all this kind of thing, and I'm very careful not to be pro-drugs. I mean, I'm a harm reduction, civil liberties kind of approach to this, and I think that's our best approach when we're going out in the public. But we've got to remember our politicians, as soon as they feel like it's safe, they'll raise their voices. But right now, it's one of those third rail issues. So. Um, so my advice to you, if you're going to be speaking out on this, uh, please understand we've got to get out of the choir. I mean, I love to talk on main stage, but I'd much rather talk at a Rotary Club. I'd rather talk to 200 Rotarians. I, I mean, I'd rather talk to a couple thousand people here. That's more fun. But I'm going to get more accomplished if I go to a Rotary Club, you know. You can do that, you know. Half the people here, they put on a suit the next day and go to work, you know. You can take it there. We don't need to be in the closet. You can't believe uh, the fun I've had speaking out on this all over the country. I got the Lutheran of the Year Award, the Wittenberg Award, in Washington, D.C., and they introduced me as a board member of Normal. That wouldn't happen a long time ago, but now people know in their hearts of hearts that you can be smart on marijuana policy, and that means taking the crime out of this thing. So... I'm just going to wrap up here in a sec. Don't be scary. I'm, this is one of my themes. All my friends are normal. We try not to be scary. You know, we're out there in the public. You don't want to be scary. Look at some of your friends. They're just flat out scary. Not to you and me, but to the person that needs to vote for this. They're scary. I'm not saying it's right. The reality is they're scary. So take the scary out of it. Uh, get involved in other things so that when you're involved in something, you're involved in something like really nice and compassionate drug policy. It confuses people. You know, they want to like you, they want to support you, they respect you, and then they see what you're into here also, and they give you more time. They give you more credibility, and I find that works really well. Preempt attacks. I'm telling you, they're worried about kids, they're worrying about driving, and they're worried about hard drugs. You can preempt that. The only thing gateway about marijuana is its illegality. That's what the Europeans have learned. 
I mean, as soon as it's illegal, the only way you can get it, I mean, the way you, most people get it is from some criminal on the street who is interested in getting you hooked on something more addictive and more profitable. We can talk about that. And then just be straight and honest about you believe the responsible adult use of marijuana in a recreational way is a civil liberty. I always like to say I'm a hard-working, tax-paying, kid-raising, church-going citizen of this country, and if I work hard all day long, want to go home and relax with a joint, that is my civil liberty. Yes, sir. So, one of my favorite things I've heard all in the last couple of years is when our uh, friend John McKay, you know, our, the prosecuting attorney, former prosecuting attorney, when he stood on a stage with us in the ACLU thing here and he said, it's, he's a Republican. I mean, he's just a hard law and order kind of guy. He said, this marijuana law that we're living with is flat out bad law. We got that going on in our favor. It's bad law. Mayor LaGuardia said back in the 30s when they're dealing with stupid alcohol laws, he said, if a society has a law in the book that it does not to intend does it not to intend to enforce consistently across the board, the very existence of that law erodes respect for law enforcement in general. That's a big problem in a society, and we got that going on right now with this war on marijuana. I want to remind you once more, we have a window. You'll hear other people talking about it. It's an election year next year, and I understand only during a presidential election do kids get out and vote in numbers enough to make our initiatives viable. I, I, I know there's frustration. I'm a, I'm a co-sponsor of 502, and I really have a, I'm really sad that we can't have this grow it at home provision, you know? That's just something I'm gonna live with. I know other people in the medical community have their concerns and the whole driving thing, but these laws evolve. And my main concern is to get over the summit so that people out there will see they made a law that legalized and regulated and taxed marijuana, and you know, it's no big deal. Consumption didn't go up, crime went out, and now we can get along with normalizing this thing. It's a tough challenge to get 240,000 signatures. If you want to do something, and you can just write a huge check and you're rich, do that, and they'll hire other people to get those signatures. But I think it is really good citizenship, and it's good hempmanship. If you go over to that booth, 502, check out one of those little clipboards, go home, go to your workplace, let people you know, this is smart law. This is good citizenship. This is how we're gonna end the war on marijuana. And then, decades from now, we can tell our grandchildren that Washington State was the first state that started the end of the prohibition on marijuana. That is an exciting opportunity. Okay, so that's just what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. I hope that we can enjoy the rest of the Happy travels, even if you're just staying home, okay? Thank you very much.